Here on day two of the Forum Solar Praxis here in Berlin, I'm Jonathan Gifford, the editor-in-chief of PV Magazine, the global edition. Well, the tables are being packed up. There's a bit of noise in the background, but just moments ago, the Future PV Forum really spotlighted a series of early stage technologies that have the potential to transform our industry. Let's have a look at some of them. Yeah, I mean, it's an excellent platform of gathering very different groups together, somewhat unique. You have the investor community, the bankers, you have marketing people, and you have politics, uh, people from politics. And uh, it's hard to reach this audience all at once. Usually you have to go to four conferences to reach them one by one. So here you have the mix. And that interaction between these different crowds with their different perspectives and interests uh, makes it so viable also to have a vivid discussion and highlight not only one perspective, but all, all different interests and, and ideas. And why was storage included this year? Usually it's cell module, these kind of technologies. Well, that's the history and dynamics of technology. So solar is still exciting to move forward also technology-wise. But it becomes more and more obvious with the decreasing feed-in tariffs and decreasing subsidies that it must be paired with some storage solutions. So it gets more interdependent, solar and storage. And even if you look from the storage people's side, yes, from storage guy, uh, electrical vehicles is one big market. But the second biggest attention they do have on solar systems systems at the moment. At the Future PV Forum, the elevator pitch was taken out by Ingvar Ulverg from Solvotaics. Now it's a 3-5 approach or 3-5 cell approach onto a silicon substrate. Can you tell me just very briefly about the technology and why you think that it has a po uh, potential to impact the market? Well, so silicon uh, solar cells will max out around 23 to 25 percent. Uh, that's the end of the roadmap for silicon and after that uh, the companies have to look at tandem cell solutions to really boost efficiency beyond that point. So 3.5 materials have been around for a long time in solar and electronics. They're stable, well-known materials uh, and have demonstrated really high efficiencies for uh, multi-junction solar cells, concentrators. So what Solotex is doing is to, uh, to really cut the cost of, of uh, producing 3-5 materials by using nanowires in a continuous flow process called Aerotaxi. And that will allow us to, to make a film that we can stack on silicon solar cell uh, without concentration uh, so for flat plate modules and get to uh, you know, 25 to 30 percent uh, efficiencies in the future. So, so that's why I think we have the future going for us. And where are you on the roadmap towards that now? So we are making a, a small scale, uh, I would say, research samples uh, and cells. Uh, we have demonstrated uh, for the for the top cell, we have demonstrated 15.3% uh, efficiency. Uh, so our focus now is is really on the aerotaxi growth technology, where we have built a pilot tool. Uh, that's on the megawatt scale, uh, but but then we still have to to scale up uh, the film and the uh, and the solar cell, the solar cell to sort of a pilot size. So that's that's where we're at. Now, perovskites have been very much a, a hot topic within the research community. How long do you think it's going to take before it, uh, perovskites go from the research community, R&D from academic institutes and research institutes like yours, into something meaningful in terms of production? Yeah, that's of course a good question. Uh, there's a very steep rise in efficiency in the last few years already for this technology that has taken a lot of attention, therefore. But um, there's other issues like, for example, stability, reliability of the materials, of the devices in general. So there's a lot of work still to be done on the research level and on the further development level. Durability and stability of the perovskite, of course, is one of the major hurdles. How confident are you that that can be overcome? Well, um, there's, again, different aspects on that. One of the main uh, things is uh, sensitivity to, for example, humidity or oxygen. Uh, one of the uh, simple things to do there is to have good packaging. Modules, making glass, glass packaged modules uh, prevents already uh, very much this uh, ingress of humidity and oxygen. So uh, it also has been shown already in, in some, uh, some studies uh, that uh, IEC standards uh, of 1,000 hours have been reached with these glass, glass uh, encapsulated devices. So encapsulation is one part. The other thing is, of course, uh, also sensitivity to uh, heat uh, stress. 
and that's another aspect. And there, really, materials research has to come in to further improve that, to make the, the perovskite material itself more stable, also the contacting layers, the interactions with these interface layers. So it's really material study that still has to be done to uh, improve that. How would you respond to those that would say, you know, it's great to talk about these technologies, three, five applications, tandem cells, but really they're very long away. They're, they're, they're very far in the horizon until we actually see them in our industry. Uh, I would answer them immediately that, yes, uh, things need their time. It's clear that some of the presentations we heard today take still five or ten more years. Perovskite may be rather a candidate for ten more years. However, I do believe that market introduction can be faster than the waiting time Perk had to wait for. Uh, I think the problem we saw in technology upgrades in the recent five years is that the whole solar industry invested so much on capacity expansion and, and other things, and they burned money. And if you look at a lot of big players in the solar industry, they still have heavy debt and they have to keep their cash together. So you saw pretty much a stagnation of implementation of technologies the last five years. Nearly nothing has happened. And it was a big reason for that was, was cash problems. And now slowly the company is coming back to zero profit or a tiny uh, positive profit and they immediately start to reinvest. And that's why Perk is happening now. So it was the waiting time until they have, are back in a cash position. And uh, I think now the development is more uh, more systematic, more sustainable, so we don't believe that uh, this would happen again, then they turn in a, in a very red debt uh, phase. So we believe companies do have regular money to reinvest in new technology, so there is not this, this waiting time until they have enough money together to invest in the next step. So we believe it's going faster now.